Hi, I'm Tim Moore with Old Town Canoes and Kayaks. Today I am in my Old Town Sportsman Autopilot 136. I'm in an estuary on the New Hampshire coast fishing for striped bass. So in these estuaries, there are a couple of key places that I look for striped bass. And the majority of that is structure related. There's two things I look for, structure and birds. There's a lot of structure in this river and if you look around at the surface, you can actually see where these areas of structure are. I'm on an outgoing tide, so the tide's coming at me right now. And what you're going to see is you'll, when, the, when the water hits structure, there will be an area of flat water and then rough water beyond it. The rough water is actually is created by the current flowing over that structure. So if you see the rough, the, the, the line between the rough and the smooth water, the edge of that smooth water is actually where that structure most likely is, right on that edge. And it creates the turbulence that you see that carry off of the structure. What I'm gonna do in the autopilot right now is, is I'm gonna get up to these edges of this structure and I'm gonna spot lock and I'm gonna cast up. Now I don't, this is probably the only time that I will ever fish for striped bass, cast a lure, and retrieve it with the current. Most of the time I, I like to retrieve my lures against or across the current, across current seams, across rips, things like that. Because it's a more natural uh, presentation, it's a more natural way for, for bait fish to run. But in this situation where I'm going to spot lock in this current, I don't have any choice. It, the current's going to pull me down, I'm going to be facing the current, so I'm going to cast up current and I'm going to work my my lure back and the first lure that I'm going to fish is probably my number one favorite striped bass lure along the New Hampshire coast and that is a paddle tail shad. This is a six inch paddle tail shad. One really important piece of equipment that I bring with me that I, that I use are these um, speed clips. I like the tactical angler speed clips. They look like a paper clip and it allows you to put your lure on really quickly and they're secure they stay on so I can switch lures really quickly if I need to and I'm just gonna sit in this current and uh, work this shed some of the other shads um, you know there are a lot of companies that make them some of my favorites storm wild eye swim shad, shad the um, savage gear makes a shad there are a lot of really good shads on the market but you want to find one that's got a, a big paddle tail and the softer the better the only trouble with the soft ones is they get torn up really quickly but uh, they have a much better action in the water and they create a lot more vibration and that's really what these fish are going to key in on right now is, is the vibration. Color, general rule is bright colors on bright days, dark colors on dark days. Um, there are some squid around so I'm using some purplish pinks just to kind of simulate you know those alarmed squid and I'm just going to cast my lure up into the current and then I'm going to reel back and, and follow it back and keep it off the bottom. Sometimes you have to reel a little bit faster to keep the lure up off the bottom. You don't want on the bottom, you want just off the bottom. So I am gonna let it sink, but I'm gonna follow it back, keeping my line tight with my reel. So I'll pitch it out there. I'm gonna get it up beyond that structure. It's not quite there. I might have to move down a little bit and I'm gonna reel and just keep my line tight and I'll give it a jig every now and again. But you wanna keep it tight because as it drifts by those fish, if they're down there holding in that, in that structure in the current, when they see it, they'll come up off it and grab it. I just marked a bunch of fish up here in front of me. I'm gonna spot lock. I'm gonna cast up ahead of me. Huge grass mats coming at me. I'm gonna see if I can retrieve this back. And just basically kind of like slow pitch jigging. Very similar technique. You may need to go up past your structure and drift down. Now I'm in 30 feet of water right now. These, the fish that I just marked were in, oh, I just got bit. There's one. Oh, that one, that, oh I lost it. Another one on it. Oh, they're all over it. This one. Not a very big one. Small schoolie. Oh, he's in that current now. 
feels a lot bigger when they get in that current. Well, it might be bigger than I thought it was. Either that or a bigger one just ate it. Nice schoolie though. So there he is. I'm not going to keep him out too long. There's a pile of fish like this around. I want to talk about one of the most important tools in my arsenal and that's my gripper. Safe handling of these fish is really important and this plastic gripper is tied off to my handle on my kayak so I can put that fish back in the water. If I want to take a picture of it, I can leave the fish in the water. You, you want to minimize the amount of time the fish are out. You see I wet my hands. I try not to touch them with the glove portion of my hands. I use just my fingertips with no gloves so I'm not removing too much slime. And that fish is in the water. A lot of current flowing over its gills. That plastic gripper is good because it doesn't tear them all apart if they go bananas like the metal ones do. And I can let that fish just hang down there in the water while I set up my camera or do whatever it is I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna take a picture of this fish. I'm just gonna release it, but I did wanna show you one of the, one of the pieces of equipment that I use. I'll say goodbye to that one. Probably more fish down there on that structure, so I'm just gonna cast up there until I burn through the whole school and have some fun. And eventually the tide's gonna drop on these on this structure and there isn't gonna be enough water here. And boat traffic and fishing pressure, you know, will push these fish off of this structure and, and lack of water. As the water level drops on the structure the current's going to speed up that's moving over it and eventually the fish will move off of it. There's a lot of fish down 30 feet but it's going to be tough to get down there with a with a half ounce. I do have some three quarter ounce heads with me that I can use to get down there on the bottom of this structure if I need to. Oh, have a bite. There we go. Oh yeah. That's a good one. This might be keeper size. It's really tough to tell when they're down in this current. When they get down near that structure, there's a lot of current flowing over the rocks. They uh, really use every bit of that current to their advantage to try to get away. Now, another thing that light tackle in a kayak is really fun, and this is about as light as I'll go. And I'll talk here in a minute about my the setups that I use, but. Light tackle can be fun, but the one thing you don't want to do is overfight these fish, because you will kill them. Especially as we progress into the summer and the water and starts to warm up. We're only at about 67 degrees right now, which is pretty cool for this time of year. It's generally 70, 68, 70. And as the tide goes out, the water temperature rises. So in this particular area, we see about an eight degree temperature spike from high to low tide. It'd be eight degrees warmer at low tide than it is at high tide. So you don't wanna fight these fish too long. So if I were, it's really fun. I have some smaller rods. I have a couple, this is a seven foot two rod. I have some six, eight rods that are really fun to fight these fish on, but you can overstress them. And even though they swim away, they they won't, a lot of those, a lot of the fish won't make it if you, if you over fight them. So you wanna, take good care of them while you while you ha handle them but also take care, good care of them when you when you fight them oh yeah about the same size a little bit bigger than the last one I think yeah nice fish really healthy fish really respectable I'm gonna get a measurement and a picture of this one so I am going to put it on the gripper so I can get everything ready. 
The only time I really worry too much about what depth I'm fishing is in the middle of the day. In the middle of the day when it's bright sunshine, I'll fish a little bit deeper a lot of the times, but I have caught stripers in anywhere from five to 50 feet of water. Catch a lot of fish in 25, 35 feet of water. Today I caught some fish in 30 feet of water. I caught some fish in 18 feet of water. It really depends on just where those fish are, where they want to be. So you just have to get out and look around. Use a fish finder. I have side imaging. I have a Hummingbird Helix 9 uh, with the mega imaging. So I can actually cruise around and find pods of fish. That's ex especially helpful at night when the fish are cruising the shallows. I can drive through those shallows without blow or along outside of them without blowing the fish out and scan with the side imaging and find those fish. Now, de there's one. depending on how you're fishing, this is a small one, I think. Well, maybe not. Depending on how you're fishing, no, not so small. You, you can spot lock like this, and this technique is, seems to be working. You can also, if you're, if you're in a battery powered kayak like this one and, and you're gonna fish for a long period of time, you, spot lock doesn't use quite as much juice as drifting back and forth, heading up into the current and coming back. Cause I'm running this on nine, nine to 10. To get up in the current and I'm only gonna fish for a few hours so I may make some drifts depending on uh, the structure if I fish this area off uh, I can you can make drifts back and forth over the structure about the same size we're all running about 26 to 28 inches this about 24 maybe Nice healthy, healthy size of schoolie this year, which is nice. We've been inundated with 15 to 18 inch fish the last few years, so it's nice to see these, this age class actually getting a little bit bigger. Yeah, about the same, that's about 23, 24 inches. So some of, there are some fish down about 30 feet and casting ahead of me and letting it sink as I reel back, there isn't enough time for my lure to get down to that 30 feet. So sometimes you'll have to go drift and you have to start your drift further ahead, much further ahead than where you can cast to. Make your cast and then drift back and get that lure down near the bottom and just bounce it along the bottom. Sometimes that'll work. So one of the other types of fishing that I like to do is, is surface feeds and chasing fish that are on the surface. And the way to find those fish is to look for birds. And I just had some birds come up behind me or a few fish in this rip that came to the surface. I don't see any more, but the birds are working. So I'm gonna stay over here now. When birds come up, there's always, when birds start diving, the baits come up, there's always bait there. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there is always gonna be stripers under them. So, one piece of equipment that I have learned to always keep with me is a pair of binoculars. That way when, when, it, when I see birds in the distance and they're, and they're diving into the water, I don't know if there's fish there. Sometimes it's just really shallow water that way I can look and I can look at the surface of the water and see if there are any splashes. These birds are, are working really close and there are lots of splashes and I know that there's fish here. So I don't need the binoculars right now. There's one. Oh yeah. 
decent. Oh yeah. Now, one thing you can do to, to help minimize the fight on big, if this was a really big fish, I would let go of the spot lock and fight this fish. That way I'm not pulling them against the current. This isn't a huge fish. It's probably another 26 to 28 inch fish. So I'm just gonna fight him here. I am gonna drop another mark right here. Actually I will let go of the spot lock now that I have a mark. And then I can drift in the current, fight the fish. And I'm not fighting as much of the current. Yeah, about the same size. Just got some big shoulders. Big ambition. 24, 23, 24 inch fish. Nice healthy fish. Here it goes. I'm going to put on some top water. So, one of the things I do when I'm fishing top water lures in the kayak is I take the rear treble off. This is a Daddy Mac Lures AB bomb. It's like a little dock. It's a spook. And I've had stripers attached to my hand by topwater lures. And I always, almost always, they get the front treble in their mouth. They get the rear treble buried in their head or in their eye. And I just really don't like it. So I take the rear treble off. It's worth it if I miss a few more fish. So the spook, basically just walking the dog. Keep that lure walking back and forth. Whoa, that one just rocketed out of the water off my lure. <laughs> Fish came clean out of the water. Sometimes the blow up is worth all of it. Even though you don't catch the fish. That fish, I didn't even twitch my lure and he smashed it out of the water. All right, so another one of my favorite topwater lures is made by a friend of mine named Larry Wentworth. Big Fish Bait Company, pencil poppers. And he made me these special pencil poppers. And I did leave the rear treble on, treble on these ones because of the way they fish. <laughs> so this is where the grippers are going to come in handy because another one jumping right there I do have multiple trebles on this lure and I do not want one in my hand so now we're going to land this fish grippers that one
people often want to know which tide is the best for catching striped bass and that that is really subjective to your confidence the area that you're fishing and the time of year I have places that I've never caught a fish on an incoming tide. I've only ever caught fish there on an outgoing tide. And then I have other places that I've only catch them on an incoming. So a lot of that depends on some places are good on an outgoing tide early in the morning. Not so much in the middle of the day. Sometimes it depends on the month. So it really depends. And, and the best way to find that out is just to get out there and, and fish these places and you know, if you don't catch anything on an outgoing tide, because a lot of people prefer an outgoing tide, especially in the spring, they won't go back and fish an incoming tide there. Or you'll do really well for several years on an, on an outgoing, and then all of a sudden an incoming is producing. Generally, in the springtime, most striper fishermen in the river will prefer an outgoing tide because the water's cold. And so, like I mentioned earlier, the water temperature will rise as the current, as the as the water level falls. As the tide goes out, the temperature rises. So, when the water's cold, you want to take advantage of those spikes in in temperature. As you get into the later in the summer, when the water is warm up in here, you want to switch, and it'll be the opposite. You'll fish the incoming tide when those nice cool waters, fresh cool waters, are, are coming in those fish will come in and feed during those times as opposed to when the water is warmest. There's one little guy. Caught me off guard. Not tiny. Yeah. That one. Hard time. I, I have a tennis elbow, so I have a hard time high sticking the rod. Oh, there. And we have, on average, you know, a, well, six to eight foot tides here in New Hampshire, and. So as you get four hours into the outgoing tide, a place that had six feet of water over it might only have three feet of water or two feet of water over it. And so the fish will move. They'll move off that, those areas and they'll move into deeper water or they'll just continue out. There's a lot of different fish in the ocean front. Uh, because you can just move out into different structure. It's a whole different ball game fishing on the ocean front. One of my favorite times to fish for stripers is early in the morning. But it's mid to late afternoon, so well, it's evening now. But we have this cloud cover, a little bit of a sprinkle. And I really didn't expect to see as many fish still in the river with all this fresh water that's dumping in here, but they're here. But generally, I like an early morning high tide. Start fishing right at high tide, just as the sun's rising. You get on a calm day, you'll get a ton of surface activity first thing. A lot of fish activity, fish moving out. They're feeding, they're hungry. There's just a lot going on. But you can catch stripers in the middle of the day. Sometimes you'll just have to fish deeper. Just can't expect, you know, the surface feeds in the middle of the day like you'll get early in the morning or in the evening or on a cloudy day and like I said an outgoing tide earlier in the year we're mid-season now so we can get away with fishing pretty much either and an incoming tide later in the summer when you're fishing you know rivers and estuaries like this The striper migration begins mostly in the Chesapeake Bay. Striped bass on the east coast, probably the most 
one of the most sought after game fish species by kayak anglers. If it's second to anything, it's bass, freshwater bass. And the migration begins in the Chesapeake. They migrate um, from the Chesapeake. They spawn in the Chesapeake Bay and the Hudson River Valley, the uh, Hudson River. And then they migrate north in the spring. And they spend most of the summer migrating north all the way up into Canada. And then eventually they will turn around and we'll get what we call the fall run. And they will head back south and spend the winter down near their spawning grounds, natal rivers that they that they spawn in, and or in the Chesapeake and out offshore, and then they'll run back into those natal rivers and, and spawn in the spring before they make their migration north again. I want to go over my setups a little bit. The two rods that I fished today are both seven foot two. That's about as long of a rod as I like to fish. I like a seven foot rod. If I need to go out around the front of my kayak, I can to get to the other side, uh, get away from the trolling motor if the fish are going underneath. This particular rod, this is a Daiwa Tatula. Um, it is a, it's a seven foot two shaky head rod. It's a bass rod. The reason I like these freshwater bass rods from Daiwa is because the weight and the handle length. A lot of saltwater rods have really long handles. Even this, this jigging rod, this Harrier X jigging rod, which I love, it's a head, good heavy rod, good big fish rod, but the handle's pretty long. So when I fish this in my kayak, the reel is out here quite a bit. So it hits the seat back. So I find myself fishing kind of across myself quite a bit. So I like these smaller handles. This is a, um, uh, this reel is a, is a Dio Ballistic. It's a 4000D. This is mag sealed, so they use their mag magnetic oil in it, so it will stop up to 11 psi. So salt water isn't going to get in there. You know, if just under normal use, I don't have to worry about as much about it. Um, when I rinse it off, I don't have to worry about it. a lot of times. If you hit uh, most reels with a hose, the psi is is too high on those reels. It will actually force water into the reel, and you've done more harm than good. So this is my Tatula with the ballistic. My other rod is. Also a Daiwa, this is a seven foot two Kage shaky head rod. And this is a little bit heavier duty rod than that Tatula. It's also a little bit heavier in weight. And I actually have a Saltus 3000 reel on here. So they're both saltwater reels. The rods are not, I rinse my gear after, after every time I use them. As soon as I get home today, I'll take my kayak and I'll rinse it. I'll rinse my motor and I'll rinse all my, my tackle because your hooks will rust that I use today, I'll rinse all that and I'll rinse my rods and just rinse them. Don't pressure wash them. Don't hit them full force with the sprayer, uh, but just give them a good rinse, get all the salt off of them, especially on the guide frames. Um, they, they'll tend to rust, especially where these are fresh water, but I haven't had any problems with this one. This is, I've had this um, Kage longer. I've fished, this is my second summer with it and I'm really happy with it. It's a little bit beefier, but I like the nice short handles. I don't want to go any shorter than this because you saw a couple times, I'm having some tendonitis issues, but the real, the handle popped out uh, from my arm and, and I had to two hand uh, these the rods a couple times, but some of that's because of the current, some of that's because my, my elbow's a little bit sore. So those are my two favorite rods. When I get a little heavier, I'll switch over to this is a, more strictly a jigging spinning rod. This is a Harrier X from Daiwa, and I have a Saltus Back Bay reel on it. This is a this this will handle some of the bigger fish. So when I fish at night, I'll use this rod pretty pretty exclusively for weighted weighted jigs, weighted lures, and live bait. And I will fish live eels at night. They do fish really well. They catch big fish. I've caught all my biggest stripers on live eels, but Fish these hoagies, uh, I really like them. The black or blamber at night, white or pink during the day, and fish them exactly the same way at night that you would fish an eel. If you drift and drag your eels, drift and drag a hoagie, you'll catch fish on them. If you swim your eels, swim your hoagie, and, and you'll still catch fish on them. So this is a medium, medium, or medium. Yeah, this is a medium. So uh, it's got plenty of beef to it. Spider hitching a ride. Plenty of backbone, big fish rod, heavy jig rod. My line is Daiwa 30 pound J Braid X8 Grand. 
and I'm fishing a 20 pound fluorocarbon leader. I tie my leader to my braid with an uh, FG knot. It's supposed to be the strongest knot that you can use. And they start out about eight feet. It's running about six feet now because I've retied a few times. But I like to run a six to eight foot leader. When it gets down to about four feet, I'll change it and, and put a new one on longer. Well, thanks for watching this video. I hope you found it informative and got something useful out of it. It's by no means a comprehensive striper kayak fishing video, but it's a, a, a little bit or quite a bit of uh, how I fish for them on a regular basis and how I guide for them or when I guide for them and some of my favorite lures and, and techniques and how and where I fish them.